December 5th, 2018, a man died by suicide. This was a man that I knew. This was a good man. He was a smart man. He was a funny man. And he was a struggling man. What happened to him that day was tragic and is sadly a reality for so many men and boys today. That very, very same day, it's said that eight other men or boys died by suicide. That week, approximately 54. That month of December, approximately 240 men or boys. In the year 2018, it is estimated that 4,350 men or boys died by suicide. I have one teeny tiny goal to share with you today. I want to change the way we look at therapy forever. And this is especially true for men and boys. Before I continue, it's important to acknowledge that I firmly believe that gender is expansive. In my talk, I'm going to sound like I refer to this binary of male and female. I assure you that's not my intention and that my core belief is that even looking at masculinity, we are diverse. So I'm going to take us on a bit of an adventure. We'll call it a trail hike. This trail or these trails have been carved out by people, researchers, and clinicians long before me. And I owe them a debt of gratitude. Today, my hope is to encourage more action in the realm of mental health for men and boys. How do we start? Well, let's, if we could look at some stats, I would ask you to think about the number of deaths by suicide, like I previously mentioned, um, homicide rates, perpetrators of homicide, sexual assault, domestic violence, overdose rates, addictions, automobile deaths. In all of these categories, men and boys experience disproportionately high numbers as compared to women. Why? So it's an expansive question that probably requires another TED talk, to be honest. But in a nutshell, the American uh, uh, Psychological Association refers to this idea of traditional masculinity. And the more you adhere to traditional masculine norms, the more harmful it is for your physical or mental health. If we look at traditional masculine norms, in some of my work we refer to this as the script. Generally speaking, what do men do in the face of distress in their lives? Well, the script tells us that we're going to mask that distress. We minimize, we avoid, we self-medicate. Don't show your emotions. Don't ask for help. Nothing is wrong. I'm going to go it alone. I'm going to isolate myself. And if you do get to the point where you are asking for help, some of the language you might hear, don't be a pussy or grow a pair. This is an absurdly difficult reality for men and boys to live with. And yet these norms persist today. About a year ago, I was rock climbing with one of my daughters. And on the climb right beside us, there was a young boy who was climbing with his father. And my daughter was up on the wall. And I always tell my kids, climb as far as you want. When you're ready to come down, let me know. And this boy probably heard. And he looks down at his father after about 10 or 15 feet up on the wall. And he says, Daddy, I'm ready to come down. And the father says, what do you mean climb down? We're here to climb up. And the boy starts asking again. And the father's still pushing him and pushing him. And so finally, after the kid was getting a little whiny, he comes down. And my daughter kept climbing. And the father said to his son, 
how could you let a girl pass you? And in that moment, I wanted to talk about all the stuff I'm talking to you today about. Not in a rock climbing gym, of course. But I also wanted to say, I'll probably be seeing your son in therapy in about 10 years. So, the traditional masculine norms, the culture of masculinity, it is a box that is hard to live with. There's one part of the script I do want to jump into, and that is this idea that men and boys traditionally have poor help-seeking behaviors. In fact, this is one of the most, most robust findings in the men's health literature, that men and boys tend not to reach out for help when they're struggling. And yet, there is very little of this uptake when it comes to psychological services. There is an opportunity to go to therapy. It doesn't matter if it's community-based or in a private setting or in a hospital or even in your school counselors, with your school counselors. There are those opportunities, but men and boys are not going. And so we tend to say, oh, it's because men and boys have poor help-seeking behaviors. And I acknowledge that. But let's wait a bit. I have something else to share. The culture of therapy. I'm going to assume that maybe a bunch of you have been to therapy in the past. Therapy, more or less, looks like this. I'd be willing to bet. It's time-bound. It's office-based. It's talk-focused. You're centered on exploring your emotions. And you're sitting in a chair and you're relatively still physically. And this might be a bit of an overgeneralization, but my own experiences working in mental health settings and going to therapy myself, this is what therapy tends to look like. So where are we? The literature sometimes refers to this as the culture clash of therapy versus masculinity. This is nothing new. We know this in the data in um, the field of men's health and, uh, uh, and in men who uh, uh, researchers who study masculinity. We've known this for some time. And generally speaking, how many men and boys feel comfortable at the prospect of sitting on their asses for a 50-minute hour talking about their feelings in an intimate context? And I know it's a bit of a stereotype. But the stereotype persists for a reason. Why is the couch the only option when we know it doesn't work for all men? The culture clash is leading to these alarming mental health outcomes. What are we doing about it? I originally had a little video planned for this. So I'm going to ask you to use your imaginations to come sit by the fire. And if you're comfortable, you can close your eyes. You don't have to. Imagine yourself sitting by a fire. You can smell the wood smoke. You can hear the crackling of the fire. You can see the glowing embers. And you're present. And my invitation to you while you're there is to consider that you can do therapy here. I'll invite you back to me. You can do therapy here. You can do therapy here. This is a good place to do therapy. Here as well.
This is not a bad place to do therapy. This is a great place to do therapy. This is therapy too. And one of my recent favorites, and if you don't know where that is, that's the Halifax Oval, and that's the automatic camera that takes pictures. <laughs> and that's me with a client who's skating for the very first time in his life, and he's 15 years old. I would like to expand this idea of how and where we do therapy. The more the therapy has resonance with how guys tend to show up, magic happens. So how do we do this? Three particular pathways. Um, looking at where and the how the therapy happens, I have one small example. We already know that there's tons of research out there about the benefits of being in nature. And the idea that going to a particular place or engaging in a particular activity makes you feel better. And this includes both individual and group therapy contexts. And so using this example up on the screen, if you don't already know what geocaching is, it's roughly treasure hunting. And later on, you can ask your partner what, what that is if you don't know. And so I'm working with a young guy, and he's in temporary care of the Department of Community Services. And he really loved doing this geocaching stuff. And he started doing it on his own. And in fact, whenever he had visits with his mom, or when his dad was on a day pass from jail, they would go out geocaching, because this kid was really into it. And so one day, after one geocaching session, we're sitting in the parking lot, waiting for his foster mom to pick him up. And I ask him, why do you think we do this geocaching stuff? And he says, well, you know, it keeps me off my butt. I'm not playing as many video games. I'm getting fresh air, I'm getting some exercise. And then he pauses. He says, you know, Nick, it's kind of like doing therapy when you're not here. Sometimes the therapist needs to work with whatever comes up. And so in this example here, I'm working with a 28 or 29 year old man. He's struggling with an addiction to prescription medication. He's recently divorced and I would probably argue chronically depressed. And he was having a hard time getting into any of this. But he was happy to go out and walk and hike. And so we're walking along this particular path one day and this is what we come across. And as near as we could figure, a predator of some kind, this was early in the morning, so a predator of some kind had tried to gobble up this frog. And it got away or something like that. And so we're standing by this thing. This is the actual frog, by the way. We're, I'm standing by this thing, and I'm looking at the frog, and I'm looking at my guy, and the frog, and the guy, and my head spinning. I'm like, do you see anything in this? And then he starts, he starts crying. He says, that's me. I was sexually abused as a child. Something tried to hurt me. I'm injured, and I'm struggling to stay alive. I cannot make this stuff up in an office. There's a whole bunch of other strategies and approaches that can be worked with men, and, and I could go on and on about them, but just generally speaking, adventure-based therapy, wilderness therapy, yoga and mindfulness, using community service projects, having men engage in storytelling or music, using creative expression, mentors can be super powerful, engaging in rite of passage rituals, there's all kinds of ways. We need to create, this is my second idea by the way, we need to create brave and vulnerable spaces for men and boys to explore what gender means to them. 
so that they can further examine some of the pressures placed on them, where they come from, and how it's impacting them and in their community. Brave and vulnerable spaces. Where does this work happen? I usually talk about it in terms of upstream and downstream. Upstream, we need to work with youth. And specifically, working with male-identified youth, in some sort of, there, there in, in the Halifax region, there are some junior highs and high schools who have started these guys groups where they do just this. Okay. I would also encourage these kinds of conversations with coaches and teachers and community leaders who are also working with youth. If we're looking at downstream, it's exactly what I've been talking about. We need a greater range of therapeutic approaches or therapy options, whether it's private practice settings, community settings, or in hospital-based settings. Number three, we need more training and education for gender-sensitive approaches because we need more therapists out there who are doing this work that aligns better with how men and boys tend to show up. It doesn't matter if this is happening in therapy settings as well, or social work settings, or even educational settings, because the men and boys are showing up everywhere there. Specifically, though, some things that work in the training world with men and boys, connection, connection, connection. Create a relationship. Sitting on your, in your desk with a clipboard asking these sort of robotic questions is not about relationship building. Make those relationships solid. Self-disclosure is a big one. It is pretty hard for most people, but I would argue most men and boys, to step into those vulnerable and brave spaces and sharing their sexual abuse histories or their addictions or how they've chosen in a particular moment to use violence or aggression against their children or their partners. Those are hard spaces to go to. And so demonstrating some of that self-disclosure is one of those pathways. We're taught not to do that in most therapy settings. Humor is a good one, of course. My favorite, and I don't have any data to support this, I have to be honest, is lose the dress code. Think of the average 14 or 16 year old, you know, who comes into a therapy session and I'm wearing a suit and tie and have a clipboard that I'm toting around. This is about as dressed up as I get, I will be honest, in a therapy session. And if I've got shorts and a t-shirt on, I'm a happy camper. Can you imagine every time someone wants to go into a therapy office or get help for something? Doesn't matter if it's, again, a community-based or a hospital or a private practice setting. That I've always envisioned some version of a drop-down menu. Or at least an intentional conversation about how and where the therapy can happen that best associates with that person. What happens when the therapy has greater resonance with how guys tend to show up? They tend to attend. They show up a lot more. I received three years of funding through Movember Canada to run these adventure therapy groups. And they were three months long. And we ran three of those and we had 44 guys come through the program over that time frame. And we had a dropout or attrition rate of one. And it, do your Google search, look at dropout rates in mental health settings, it's a lot higher than that. They show up, they engage and especially in the context of some of the group settings, they can explore some of that masculine script stuff. Where does it come from? How does it affect me? How do I live it? Do I want to own that script? Do I not want to own that script? What script is important for me? Newsflash, it's not just about the men and the boys. This is also about their partners and their children, and their brothers and sisters, and their parents, and their peers, and their workplace colleagues. This affects us all.
the next time you need support for anything distress, mental health related, please remember some of this drop down stuff. I do have one tiny little public service announcement, and if there's any therapy professionals in the room, I'm talking to you, is that the same question of asking what resonates for you applies to you just as much. How many therapists enjoy sitting on their butts in an office hearing really hard stories? And yet we're told that therapy has to happen a certain way. My invitation to therapists and to anyone who needs help is to ask your therapist to take you outside. Thank you very much.